Tonight, Detroit's emergency manager Kevin Orr sits down with us for a frank conversation on the city's future. It all starts right now on My Week. Michigan's turnaround is being powered by things we do better than anywhere else in the world. Today's global leaders routinely turn to Michigan to work on their most difficult problems. That's because the engineering talent in this part of the world is simply the best. So many possibilities lie ahead for Michigan's future. These opportunities are here and starting to happen. The vision for the new Michigan. Share it, talk it up, drive it home. A route map shows you where we go, but not how we get there. Because in this business, there are no straight lines, only the twists and turns of an unpredictable industry. So the 80,000 employees at Delta must anticipate the unexpected and never let the rules overrule common sense. This is how we tame the unwieldiness of air travel until it's not just lines you see, it's the world. Hi and welcome to My Week. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Christy McDonald. Detroit Emergency Manager Kevin Orr has one of the toughest jobs around. A very limited amount of time to do it in and how he does his job will affect not only the city of Detroit but the entire state of Michigan. And not only is Orr dealing with the finances, he's had to face some of the politics this past week as well. And tonight he's sitting down with us for the entire half hour at Detroit Public Television's Midtown Studio to talk about it all. Joining me as always are Maui contributors Nolan Finley of the Detroit News, Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press, and our guest tonight, Detroit Emergency Manager Kevin Orr. Gentlemen, Kevin, it's great to have you on My Week. We appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. All right, so we're going to be sitting down here for the next half hour talking about everything, of course, the finances and talking where you are with creditors right now. But I want to jump in a little bit to the politics because I think Detroiters have heard you talk about the finances. But this past week, you have made a pretty big decision, and that decision was to strip City Council President Charles Pugh of his title and of his salary. Can you explain why you made that decision? The, the only reason I made that decision is, you know, I'm in the midst of some pretty serious discussions with rank and file employees about their terms and conditions and compensation. And from my years in federal government, uh, the standard schedule of discipline, both in federal government and the military, is the higher up you go, the more responsible you're supposed to be. And so Mr. Pugh is a leader. He's president of the council. Um, his conduct should be exemplary. Um, as an example for other employees, and going missing in action at a critical time in the city's development on council, I felt was inappropriate. So what I said was, you need to come back to council. If there's a reason you need to take time off, then, then explain that reason. I'm, I'm not a public relations specialist. But more important than that, Mr. Pugh had sent me um, a memo asking me to approve medical leave. There's nothing in under the charter or under my statute for me to approve medical leave, and I didn't want to get drawn in to a situation where someone would say the emergency manager approved whatever was going on. So I said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a position and don't have the authority to approve it. You need to come back and work your job. If you can't do that, then you shouldn't be in a leadership position on the council. So I removed compensation. I kept benefits in place for whatever reason. If someone needs assistance or help, I think that's the main thing to do. And I actually said that's going to take effect this Sunday. So although it said you had to come back by five, the compensation decision went for the balance of the pay period to give a little extra time for someone to reconsider what they should do as a leader when I'm asking for some pretty severe concessions from rank and file employees. Was it disappointing that you hadn't heard from him? No, it, it, it's, it, you know, it's not particularly disappointing. I'm, 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 I'm nobody's priest and I'm certainly nobody's judge. I'm just trying to do my job as I think is appropriate, particularly for people in leadership positions in a city where leaders have all too often disappointed us. So Charles apparently is hiding or, or, or trying to avoid these very serious um, allegations right. raised by a mother who, who claims he haven't had an inappropriate relationship with her son. Do you know where he is? And as a elected official, as the president of the council, wouldn't you expect him to stand up and offer some explanation to these charges? You know, Nolan, I'm going to I'm going to stay away from that. As I said before, I'm I'm not his judge. My my decision was separate from the allegations that have been made, and they are serious allegations. Mm -hmm. We've seen them before in other contexts in Pennsylvania, so on and so forth. And I just didn't want to get caught dealing with the responsiveness of a leader to be on the job leading the council. Whatever flows from that, everyone's innocent to proven guilty. 
Um, I, am an, I am a lawyer, I'm no longer attorney because I, I don't have a bar license in Michigan, <laughs> but I am a lawyer. Um, and everyone who, who is subject to an allegation has a right to defend themselves um, as they seem appropriate. Um, I've just read the published reports in response to your question about where he is about Mr. Pugh in the Northwest somewhere, but I, I, I hope um, he's okay and I, and I hope that at some point I'll have an opportunity to respond to these allegations, but that's really his business, that's not mine. Well, you've got to be aware though of the optics here, that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Uh, as the appointed emergency manager you're stripping the second highest ranking elected official mm -hmm. uh, in the city of his, of his title. Um, uh, obviously people are, are sort of questioning what is your authority to do that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. it, certainly you could dismiss the council, right, mm -hmm. uh, as emergency manager. You could disband or not pay any council members, but, mm -hmm. but what gives you the authority to say he's no longer president, mm -hmm. which is defined in our charter as the highest vote getter? Well, section 9 of 436, my statute, says that the council shall stand down, council and mayor shall stand down, unless specifically delegated. And if you recall, I delegated power back to the mayor and the council at some criticism. Right. Um, and I did that at the time because in the statute there's certain provisions, one of which is to take a vote to fire me um, at the end of my term. And I, didn't, I thought it would be highly cynical and uh, somewhat unfair to say, well, they have a role, but I'm not going to pay them and I'm going to denude them of any authority, right. as some of my friends in Washington advised me to do, you know, the political animals, yeah. and said, gut them and leave them on the side. And I said, no, I'm going to try to work with this situation. For the first month, they were taking votes. One of the most difficult ones was the retention of my old firm, Jones Today. And I sat on the sidelines and let that happen. So I really tried to do this right, and I think the statute gives me authority. What it does not give me authority to do is to fire anybody. He is an elected official. It has a provision whereby you can appeal to the governor, and I have not done that. Okay, because I think that, that I'm trying to divorce what I'm trying to do from an administrative and operational standpoint from whatever is going on with the allegations that are in the but paper. Can you let go things. of his sta staff? I mean, can you lay sure, them absolutely, off? Sure, absolutely. And will you take that step if he doesn't show up soon? Well, we've already taken some steps with regard to uh, both Mr. Pugh's staff and Mr. McKenyatta's staff. I mean, we're trying to save money. Mm -hmm. um, as you note, in the budget there was a little kerfuffle between the mayor and the council regarding council staff and budgets and 33% cuts. And we're not, I don't want to get involved in kerfuffle, I'm just looking at money. And if someone's not working, if someone hasn't taken that into consideration, their own staff that they hired, I, I can't. I'm in a crisis. Um, so you're just looking at money, obviously, but there is a huge leadership shift that's going to happen here mm -hmm. in the city of Detroit. And at the end of the 18 months or however long it's going to take you to do this job, you're going to be turning your work back over yes. to elected leadership. Are you watching? The politics? Are you watching the races right now? Uh, not really. Um, some of the uh, uh, candidates have asked to meet, and I've said no. Um, I, I don't want to get involved in politics. Um, I really don't don't go out to uh, events. I wasn't at the Fourth of July. I wasn't at the opening of a new command center. I don't view it as my job. I view me as being a uh, sort of a technocrat, a professional. Um, I am not a head of state, um, if you will. So I'm, I'm staying away from the politics. I don't I don't want want to get involved with it. Um, I'm aware of them. Uh, I read the news reports, but that shouldn't impact what I've got to do. What I've got to do is just based upon the logic. What about if uh, if Charles leaves the council, uh, you have him gone, you just hired Gary Brown into mm -hmm. your uh, administration, and then Kwame Kenyatta's uh, gone as well, so you've got a, a council that only has six members. And how important to you is it that they replace those members, uh, given that we've got elections coming up in, in a couple months? It, it's a short, lame duck term for the council, it is not important to me uh, that those members be replaced. As I said, I think a month and a half ago now, we're going to start moving pretty quickly. And I, the council, frankly, has been moving a little bit quicker than, than I understand in the past. Um, and I wish they would continue doing that. But focusing on replacing people going forward, a lean council to me is fine. Um, I, I've got things to do. All right, so let's talk about moving forward and jump right into the money of it all. Where are you with creditors right now? Well, we had a th uh, series of three-day meetings last week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with creditors. Um, I would say that the meetings were productive. Uh, uh, they seemed to grasp it at a very high level intellectually, uh, the gravity of the situation. Uh, the, the general response was, we get it, we understand the numbers, we've got to go back to our corporate governance, our corporate management, and have a discussion. What we ask of them after we had the uh, June 14th meeting was that we're going to follow up with these meetings and that they come back with a response to our proposal that we published on June 14th. Um, they've pledged to do that for the most part. 
Um, and we will have another series of meetings uh, starting next week with creditors. In fact, uh, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, some creditors are actually coming to town to view the city, to do their due diligence. Do you have a hard deadline? You said when this process started, 30 days, right. you would know whether it's going to be bankruptcy or not bankruptcy. Mm. We're about halfway through that 30-day period. Mm. Are you still, is that still the timetable? I'm going to keep with that timetable. Um, the, the numbers that we're going over and the analysis that we're making, certainly these are, on the creditor side, these are sophisticated financial and mm -hmm. banking professionals. Uh, they have, I've, I've had a series of ratings calls with uh, Fitch, Moody's, Standard & Poor's uh, uh, just yesterday uh, with all of them. Um, and they've done their analysis. They each have Detroit desk, people who are mm -hmm. specifically assigned to rate Detroit. Has, There's a has, ton of information out has there. Has any, any of the creditors at this point look beyond the deal you've put on the table and say, wait a minute, you've got assets here, you've got assets there, I want you to liquidate those Dur before we take a haircut. Dur Dur during those meetings, there was some of that discussion. Um, mm -hmm. you, you need to do some of that. Um, there was even a reference to, we want to look at your, uh, your FTE situation, how many people you should downsize. My view is, and I hope they appreciate this, um, Chapter 9 is designed to give the city uh, the type of leeway that it needs to make those kinds of decisions, which I view are discretionary decisions within the city's authority. Um, I think they're going a little bit afield to the extent they start looking, you know, you need, look, Mayor Bing uh, reduced the city's workforce by 2,300 FTEs. We've lost over 200 FTEs just since I've been here. That's about a quarter of the workforce in the past year and a half. We can't get much leaner, okay? We, we the majority, the police force is down. Um, city bureaucracy is working overtime in some sections. Um, we, we need to have garbage collection cleaning until we can outsource some of those functions, even at DWSD. So we're about as lean as a city can be. And for somebody to come to me and say, well, we want to second guess and look again at your uh, staffing decisions, that doesn't seem particularly pr productive with regard to the financial decisions. They should have already known of. Uh, it's, it's, no, it's, it's no surprise that Detroit has been going downhill in its ratings from 2005. This, this is not news. So I'm expecting and would anticipate some fairly quick responses. Um, if I can't get those, I'm going to stick to my deadline. You know, uh, in, the, in the municipal finance community, you, your proposal has know, taken a lot of people by surprise. Uh, some of the decisions that you've made about how to treat different creditors, uh, I, I've seen some chatter on Twitter about mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a story in the bond buyer mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. recently talking about how you're treating general obligation bonds, which mm -hmm. most people would think would be secured. You're treating them as unsecured. Mm -hmm. are, are they pushing back uh, on well, that? Well, they're pushing back in the bond buyer. But one thing, <laughs> Stephen, I would ask, do they have a security agreement? Do they have a collateral pledge? Right. As I said before, these are sophisticated financial parties who know what a mortgage is, right. okay, which is a security agreement. They don't have one, do they? So I understand the full faith and credit argument. I understand it's an argument they've got to make. I understand that if uh, I'm, I'm causing a plate tectonic shift in the world as we know it uh, by the proposal that I have and, and that the, you know, the sky will fall in with other municipalities and we've got I to think stop that's the, the battle fear. right here. Right. You know, Detroit is so, so extraordinary and our, our condition is so extreme. I can't really focus on what speculation may cause or that they have to draw a line in the sand and, and stop it here. You know, we've got to stop Pickett's charge, right? Because if we don't, we're going to lose Gettysburg. Well, that's not my concern. <laughs> my concern is right here, right now in Detroit, and I think Detroit is extraordinary. But All do right. you think that could be the kind of sticking point that could, could I mean, they could say, listen, uh, we think we'll get a better shake out of the bankruptcy court. And they also hold municipal de debt elsewhere, elsewhere where they might face the same situation. It, it, and if you set a precedent here, they're going to have to fight this battle over and over and this, over again. This, this might be the line in the sand that they want to draw and take. And as I said before, for the past three months, the decision about bankruptcy is not entirely mine. Sure. Okay? Mm -hmm. And if that's what they want and they think they can roll the dice in a bankruptcy court, I'm, I understand that. I mean, they, they, I don't have a choice. I have a certain amount of time. I burned a lot of it. I've got 15 months left to get going. I'm trying to do these negotiations in a good faith, you know, a, a non-interim basis. Um, I didn't come in and slash and cut and, and call them a bunch of names. I've been fulsome. 
We have an electronic data room that is open. They have the same access to the data that I have. What I have not heard from anybody is that the numbers that I've published are, are wrong. Right. Okay. I have not heard that the assumptions that I'm making are inaccurate. Mm -hmm. I have not heard that it would take 68 years if we took all the free cash that <laughs> we have in the city, 200 and 250 million dollars a year, and we never filled another pothole. We never plowed another snow-laden uh, street. We never opened another park. If we never did anything else except pay our police, fire, EMS, and our debt service, okay, if we never did anything else, 68 years to pay this debt. I have not heard anybody say, oh no, that's wrong. Uh, so that, all right, that's so the reality I'm dealing so with. So let's Christine. talk about the odds that you gave. You said 50-50 yes. for bankruptcy. Have you yeah. changed those odds in the last couple of weeks? I have not changed those odds. I'm, 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 I'm still hoping that uh, reason will prevail over invective and uh, public relations, and that they'll just look at Detroit as unique, sui generis, having to do with our particular problems, which have been coming here for 40 years. There's no other city in the nation like, there are other cities with problems. There's no other city like Detroit. Okay, so <laughs> you, you, have you sat down yet with the pension funds in terms of talking about uh, the pension debt? I know you've yes. talked to them about health care. Have you had your conversations with them about the pension debt, and how are those talks going? We talked about health care, and we're going to have another series of meetings with the pension funds, too, next Wednesday. And we're going to talk about that debt. Um, that's a difficult conversation, and I'm, I, I want everybody to understand I'm, I'm very appreciative. You know, my mother is a pensioner. I mean, mm -hmm. I say this all the time. I'm, I, I, one of the th greatest things in my life is that she conducted her affairs in a way that frees me not to have to worry to supplement her. So I, this is real stuff. This is very serious stuff. But the reality is, you know, I'm, I, I've been here for 98 days. Um, You're I eligible for a pension. <laughs> <laughs> How much is Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. But uh, uh, I didn't do this. This has been walking its way to this point for a long, long well, time. Well, and the Detroit News had a story this week. Thirteen uh, pensioners from the police and fire pension fund, including uh, the mayoral candidate, Benny Napoleon, mm -hmm. have collected already a million dollars out of the pension fund. Yeah. And, you know, when you think about how we got here yeah. and you think about going forward, I mean, you've got to put some sort of stop to these generous pensions, don't well, you? Well, you know, that, that's, that's a million dollars from my perspective over a number of years that they earn. I mean, uh, one of the pensioners, the ex-police chief, has, has been out for a long, long time, and goodness knows he's been stabbed. Um, he's been on the job, probably has some level of disability, as a lot of officers and firemen do. So I'm not, I'm not focused so much on the fact that they earned what they were told they were entitled to. I'm focused on the fact that this is an emergency, a crisis. And I, if I could keep those promises, I would. It doesn't bother me that mm. they get expensive, but the pensions don't have the money to keep those promises, and we haven't been giving them the money. And that's all this is. And what are your concerns about the mismanagement of the pension funds? You know, I don't know if it's mismanagement or, or bad timing or judgment. That's why I asked the uh, inspector general and the auditor to take a look to help me out. Um, we have some analysis from pension analysis about their funding levels of where they are. I'm, I'm really trying to stay away from attribution and accusation. I'm just trying just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. You know, they can drag that. I'm, I'm really trying to just deal with the externalities that are on the ground today and say this, this is the reality because I want to remove the emotion and the attribution and the blame and just say, I don't care who did it. I don't care we got here. This is where we are and this is what we can't. We cannot have a city that in the next three years spends over two-thirds of its budget just on legacy obligations. It won't run. The city will fall apart. It will end up being like a Gary, Indiana that's shuttered. We can't have that. So do you expect that current pensioners, for example, may end up uh, having to sacrifice some of what they're getting, or is this something that will affect, you know, current employees once they do retire? I've, I've said everybody's going to, at some level, probably be impacted by this decision. We may have to go from a defined benefit plan to a defined contribution plan for current employees. Here's the irony: for some current employees, we have some leaving. You know, I want to say to them, you know, you may want to stay because you can actually fund your. If you have time to work, you can actually enhance your retirement benefit by funding it as opposed to leaving it. Yeah. Uh, with the plan, so it may be in your interest to stick around. But every everybody's going to be impacted at some level. And do you feel like you might be able to tear that impact, though? I mean, if, I think a lot of people are concerned if you've got a 70-year-old uh, pensioner, what what is that person's 
uh, you know, flexibility in terms of going to earn more money if you take from them. It's that's different from someone who's 55 sure. and retired, which sure. we have a lot of those too. 78 year old can't go back into the job market right. with any reasonable expectation of earning any salary. And I know that in Chicago, for instance, they had a settlement agreement where they had a tier plan for pensioners. We've been we've been looking at other communities and mm -hmm. other things, and and we're taking all that into consideration. But our our starting point is just to look at, you know, th there's a hardship here, and it may be hardship cases, healthcare. Uh, someone who's doing a regimen sure. right now, for instance, that needs to continue that regimen because it has a real impact on their life. I'm very concerned about those issues. You know, I, I don't want to be the guy that literally came to this job um, and ends up impacting people through the law of unintended consequences in a very serious and severe way. But I have to start somewhere, and that's why we want to have this dialogue. Now, you have the authority to dissolve the pension boards and take over management yourself or appoint a management, appoint mm -hmm. a new board. Mm -hmm. um, in effect, you could be negotiating with yourself here. Right. Why haven't you done that? Do you, th do you see yourself doing that? You know, Nolan, um, I believe someone asked me that question <laughs> um, a while back, and I'm uh, here again. And maybe, you know, this is, maybe this is a, a little bit of my own fault. I'm trying to do this in a good faith way without any contrivance. So if, if the funds are below 80% of their unfunded actuarial liability long term, and we have some reports that some of them are. In fact, I think GRS General Services admitted as much a couple of weeks ago in the press before my June 14th meeting, Monday before that meeting. Um, if, if we have someone, we're going to look at that. Um, you're right. I, I would end up having to negotiate with myself, and I know what that outcome would be. But I want to make sure before I do that that it's it's a well both documented and and appropriate um, uh, uh, action to take. And I anticipate making that decision within the next week or two. Let's talk a little bit about health care for current employees sure. and also for the retirees. Your plan depends a little bit on the Affordable Care Act and the exchanges. Are you concerned mm -hmm. at all if for some reason something slows down with the exchanges or things don't work out quite so well that that could impact your decisions? Yes. Um, for instance, in the paper yesterday or day before, uh, some of the employer uh, penalties for, were extended out by the federal government until 2015. Those don't directly impact us with standing up the uh, health care, state health care pools. But yes, I am concerned that um, that the timing would not be quite appropriate. So we're keeping a pretty close eye on those developments. In fact, as part of my plan, one of the things that I'd like to do, be able to do, is give each uh, person with regard to health care obligations a monthly stipend. So they're not totally out in the cold. Some communities have, have gotten out of the health care business totally in, uh, on, in the East Coast. Uh, you know, some some have just said, we're done. Here's your final payment. It's a token uh, city of Stockton. It was a 1% payment. And they said, we're, we're out. We're not doing anything else. We're trying to come up with a plan so we leave no one totally out in the cold. Now, I recognize a couple hundred bucks a month may not address the needs of some people, depending upon where they are in the actuarial tables and, and what their particular afflictions are. But it's, it's at least it's something. It's, it's not nothing. And that's why it's such a uh, delicate balance between us and the creditor cohort, and I really need to, them to understand. So I, as you said, Stephen, I get all these calls about why we just sold this, and, and we're first, and this is a, uh, uh, you know, cats and dogs will begin holding hands if you, if you somehow <laughs> don't pay municipal bonds and all this kinds of stuff. But I've said, guys, I, I've got people who may die. Now, you, okay. you mentioned earlier the creditors questioning full-time employees, and you talked about garbage collection and, and the potential, perhaps, to outsource. Have you started fixing the broken processes in the, in the city, the broken departments, the broken yes. uh, services? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and when will we see sort of a, a comprehensive outline of what your okay. vision for that is? Okay. Well, well, we've done some things uh, immediately. We have a new chief. Mm -hmm. uh, chief of Police, who's a change agent, a guy who's going to get right at it. In fact, uh, day before yesterday, was out in the field on a major uh, stolen car ring bus, congratulating the officers and you know making sure they understand he's behind him. And frankly, a lot of unions have reached out to me and said, you know, we're going to support this guy and see what we can do. Uh, to that extent, I delayed the uh, uh, some of the 10 percent cuts for 30 days um, to give that chief an opportunity to get his get his feet on the ground and see what works for him because he might come up with a plan 10 percent sh 10 hour shifts as opposed to 12 hour for some officers that work so that the work rules are not so so severe. I mean, we cannot expect our police to work 12 hours for the next 100 years of the right. shift. That's just not reasonable. We, we stood up the Public Lighting Authority. They selected DTE to get some of our lights up and running, so we did that fairly quickly. We're sending out an RFP for garbage 
because we think there's cost savings there and we can increase bulk click up, uh, pick up on a weekly basis as opposed to just monthly and we can have the potential institute a recycling plan effort. We have no recycling. Light bulbs, with cadmium, nickel, lead are going into the landfill. That's leaching into the water. We're creating an environmental liability just by our own practices that we're not even thinking of, which we've never addressed. Every other community does it and we don't. So we want to stand that up. And, and finally, but certainly not least, is that's why I hired Gary Brown. Gary is a, a known whistleblower, a known profile in Courage, both on the council and in his job, and he knows the city. And one of the things I recognize in doing my job, you know, I'm, I am an outsider, and, you know, there are a lot of people that I heard from who are saying, this guy's only going to be here for 18 months, we can wait him out. I want to make sure everybody understands, nobody's waiting me out, okay? We, I now have somebody who understands city government, who's going to get down into the entrails, you know, throw the bones on and read, read the uh, signs and understand what needs to be done to consolidate some of our services to make us stronger, faster, lighter as a city. Um, I've also uh, reached out to some folks both in the academic community and the uh, 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 philanthropic community to start a model charter review process. Uh, so I'm already thinking now that when I'm gone, what is the outcome? What do we have to make city government more efficient to deliver services um, and processes to the people that are 21st century? That's a model, right. That is a model city. Right. Uh, going forward. Well, so that's and that's where we're going to have to leave it right there. Kevin Orr, thank you so much for joining us for this entire special episode of My sure. Week. We so appreciate it. Yeah. And we look forward to seeing what, uh, what, what happens in the next yeah. couple of weeks. Knock on wood. <laughs> we're going to get it done. <laughs> okay. And thanks, guys. And thanks thank so you. much for watching. That'll do it for My Week. You can always find us on demand at myweek.org. And make sure to join the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter. And thanks to our crew here at our Midtown studios. And for all of us at Detroit Public Television, I'm Christy McDonald. Have a great weekend. Come back and see us next week. Take care. Thank you very, that was very quick. Much. Yeah. See how that was quick. Michigan is dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and economic growth. Learn more at businessleadersformichigan.com. A root map shows you where we go, but not how we get there. Because in this business, there are no straight lines, only the twists and turns of an unpredictable industry. So the 80,000 employees at Delta must anticipate the unexpected and never let the rules overrule common sense. This is how we tame the unwieldiness of air travel until it's not just lines you see, it's the world.